Greetings. Um, my name is Jeff Long. I'm the pastor of Farmington United Methodist Church, and our church's mission is to help ordinary people become spiritually thriving servants of Christ for the sake of the world. Currently, I'm preaching through the book of 1 Peter. This is the second sermon out of the book of uh, 1 Peter. Our passage for today is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Let me read that to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When I was 16 years old, God called me into ministry. Previous to that, I thought I'd probably end up as a gym teacher or a math teacher or something like that. Mayville wasn't very big and those seemed to be my options. I was looking at Cortland University as the college that I would attend, and I think I had pretty typical life goals. But at the age of 16, I had an experience, and it was as if God was saying to me, Jeff, your life goal now has changed. Your life goal now is to be a pastor. Now that experience changed everything for me. And I began the long, slow process of preparing for ministry. I went undergraduate to Houghton College for five years. I went to seminary at Asbury Seminary for another four years. That means nine years I spent in academic preparation. During those years, I read big, thick textbooks. I attended lectures and seminars. I took dozens of college and seminary courses, some of which I loved and many which I didn't love. I studied and studied and studied. I learned church history and exegesis in Greek. I, I hated Greek. I wrote term papers. I did student ministries at UK Medical Center. I worked hard on my education, doing things I enjoyed and other things I didn't enjoy. Our family uh, made sacrifices through the whole uh, process. We had very little income during those days. We were barely squeaking by. We lived in what I felt was a foreign country down south in Kentucky. That wasn't anything like what I grew up in. It never felt like home. During those years, there were lots of challenges, and it seemed to take a long, long time to get through it. But we endured because of the goal we were striving for. The goal was to become a pastor. That was the goal, and the goal kept me going. You know, goals are pretty important in life. Goals are the things that keep us focused. They keep us moving forward. They keep us going when we face obstacles and when we reach the point we want to quit. Goals are important. The Christians that Peter was writing to in our passage today also faced lots of obstacles. They were Jewish Christians living in a mostly secular culture. That meant they were vastly outnumbered. They were in the minority. They were a tiny minority in a sea of unbelieving people. These first century Christians were scattered over a large area of geography. They were living far, far from where they had grown up. 
Peter calls them strangers and aliens in a foreign land. And every day it was obvious to them how different they were than the people that they lived around. Their neighbors uh, were different from them, and their neighbors resented those differences. Their neighbors persecuted them and belittled them, mocked them, distrusted them. It was hard being a Christian in the first century. It was a dangerous thing being a Christian in the first century. For them, life was one trial after another. And there were lots of reasons for those early Christians to give up and quit and abandon the faith. But these Christians, these heroic Christians, they didn't give up the faith. They kept on going. They kept the faith. They never gave up. And they never gave up because of the goal that they had in mind. Peter reminds them of that goal in verse 9. Peter says, the goal of your faith is the salvation of your soul. That's what they were seeking. That's what they were all about. They were seeking the salvation of their souls. Friends, your soul is a pretty important thing. Your soul is a big deal. In fact, your soul is the whole point of living. The early Christians looked beyond this life and for the goal of their life. They, they, they weren't finding the goal of their life in this life. It was something beyond them. Peter says in the beginning of the book, Praise be to God, for you have a new birth into two things. You have a new birth into a living hope and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Friends, we Christians have an inheritance that goes beyond this earthly life. And Peter says we are to rejoice in that, that he knows that we are suffering grief in all kinds of trials. He knows that life is crummy sometimes. He knows for those early Christians that every year for them was like a COVID year. It's tough, it's rough, there's lots of trials. But Peter reminds them and says, Christians, keep your eyes on the prize. Hang in there. Keep the faith. Stay strong. Follow Jesus for the sake of your soul. Peter says, never forget these two things. You are someday going to get an inheritance. And in this life, you are developing a really strong, tough faith. Let me talk about those two things today. The first thing, keep your eyes on the inheritance. That is, live this life in light of your future inheritance that will make it all worthwhile. Now, let's talk about inheritance for a minute. I don't know if you knew this, but the average inheritance in America today is about $50,000. If a relative of yours dies, your share of the inheritance on average is going to be about $50,000. Now, obviously that's an average. Um, Alice Walton is the richest woman in the world. She's the only daughter of Sam Walton of Walmart fame. When Sam Walton died, he left her several billion dollars. Most of you are not going to get an inheritance like that. Some of you will actually get nothing. But the average inheritance in the United States today is about $50,000. Now, back in the time of the New Testament, the average inheritance was not money at all. It was land. Land was what you wanted to inherit. And land was passed down from one generation to the next. It was important back then financially to have land. So you really desired to inherit the family farm. The people that Peter was writing to had none of that. They had no land. They had no inheritance. They were displaced people who had been moved far from home. They were strangers and aliens and foreigners in a strange country. They had no earthly financial Future. 
there was no reason for them to be optimistic at all about this life. They were not going to inherit any land. Not only that, they were in a tough spot because they were Jews. They were Jewish in heritage. Israel's history had been all about enemies marching in and taking over their land. The Babylonians had come in and taken their land. The Persians took their land. The Greeks took their land. The Romans took their land. As a nation, they had no land. That is, they had no future. But Peter, in this passage today, reminds them that, yes, you do have an inheritance. And in a sense, yes, you do have a land. It's not in this world. It's in another world. The inheritance that you have is in heaven, and you're going to receive your inheritance after you leave this world. And that inheritance is great. It's awesome. It's way better than 50 grand. Your inheritance is way better than what Alice Walton got. It's an inheritance that involves the salvation of your soul. And it's a sure thing. You can bank on it. It's a certain inheritance. It's a secure inheritance. It's an inheritance that's shielded by the power of God. You can count on this inheritance. You Christians I'm talking about today, you have the promise of heaven. You have the promise of a different kind of glory. You have the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. You have a promise of a place where there'll be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain. It's gonna be wonderful. Christian, this is your inheritance. This is a land where there's no more COVID. There's no more cancer. There's no more tumors. There's no more hatred. There's no more racism. There's no more lies. There's no more killing. There's no more of any of that bad stuff. When you receive your inheritance, all the pain of this world, all the trials of this world, all the injustice of this world will be a distant memory. In fact, you might not remember it at all. Christian, you have a inheritance that will never perish, never spoil, and never fade. And nobody can take your inheritance away from you. We all know that in this world, it's entirely possible that you can lose your inheritance. I mean, a stock market crash could cause you to lose your inheritance. Uh, identity theft could cause you to lose your inheritance. In fact, your parents going on a crazy spending spree could cause you to lose your inheritance. In this life, an inheritance can go down the drain. But Christians, if you have new, a new life in Jesus, you have a living hope. You have the promise of heaven. You have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So I want to remind you today, Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the goal, on the inheritance that you're going to receive. And don't get distracted by the trials that you're going to experience or by some measly persecution that you have to endure. Don't get distracted by health concerns or being outnumbered by people who don't believe all around you. Don't get distracted by the sin that surrounds you or the country that's going bonkers or by the turmoil that seems to be every place. Don't get distracted and despairing and certainly don't get tempted to give it all up and quit. Focus instead, as Peter instructs, on the inheritance that's coming your way an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Keep your eyes on that. Keep your eyes on the prize and don't get distracted by the hardships that come your way. Well, there's a second thing I want to talk about today. A second thing that Peter says 
you know, we've talked about you've got this future hope, this inheritance, but you've also got a present reality. And that present reality is that you, through your hardships and trials, you're developing a tough faith. I mean, you don't want a wimpy faith, do you? You don't want a faith that runs and hides in fear. You don't want a faith that's easily destroyed. You want a tough, robust, enduring, persevering, overcoming kind of faith. And Peter tells us that the trials and hardships we experience help to develop a tough faith. There are two expressions in our passage today that communicate this idea. Peter talks about the proven genuineness of your faith, and he talks about a faith that is refined by fire. That's how faith comes to pass. That's how a tough faith is created, by being refined in the fire. Peter is saying that the trials you are facing toughen you up and prove that your faith is genuine. Peter is saying that the bad stuff you're going through will actually serve to strengthen your character. And that's a very good thing. This reminds me of something James said in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. James said this, Consider it pure, pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. James says that there's a process built into the human condition, that we experience trials, and those trials help to build perseverance. And the perseverance that we experience helps to build mature character. Jesus is all about building mature, holy character. That's a good thing. And I'm not sure that you can become that without some trials. Or as they say, no pain, no gain. You need a little pain. You need a little refining by fire. And if you get that, you'll develop some spiritual grit. It also reminds me of what the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Christian, I want to encourage you to run with endurance the race God has given you. Even though your race may not be easy, and it likely won't be easy, but run your race with endurance with toughness, with grit. Run it to the glory of God. And as you do, you will grow. You'll be refined by fire. And you'll develop some of that grit. Well, it also reminds me of another passage from the book of James. James 1.12, who says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for he has stood the test, and he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Christian, you are remaining tough in the trials of life. You are staying faithful to Jesus in some challenging times. Peter says, keep up the good work. Remain steadfast. Someday you'll receive your inheritance Someday you'll receive the crown of life. So I want to ask you today, how much spiritual grit have you developed in your life? How much perseverance do you have? How much refining by fire are you going through? And what is that accomplishing in your character? 
It's not easy to do that. Trials are no fun, but there is a positive payoff. I wanna ask, do you stick with God even in the tough times? Do you run the race and finish the course? Do you stay strong when your faith is challenged? I sure hope so. Trials toughen our faith. And we are in some pretty tough times right now. And what that means is that what we're going through right now are times that have high potential for the development of tough faith and tough Christian character. God can use these times to make us strong. So let him make you strong. All right, well, I'm almost done, and I want to wrap up today with a story. You all know that I'm 65 years old. That means I'm an old guy. And as I've gotten older, I've developed some small but irritating health problems. My eyes declined, and now I mostly need glasses. My ears declined, and now I need hearing aids. My cholesterol went up, and now I have to take pills for that. This is kind of the normal stuff of physical decay. That's what we all go through. One of the annoying, irritating physical problems that I've developed recently is neck pain. Uh, now, hear me carefully. Um, my wife, Beth, is not a pain in the neck. I just have pain in my neck. When, when I get pain in my neck and it flares up, it's hard to concentrate. It, it, focuses my attention, and recently it started affecting my hearing, making my hearing go kind of weird. And so over the course of years, I've tried a lot of things for my neck pain. My, my dentist thought it was TMJ, so I wore a mouth guard for a while. That didn't help. My ENT thought it might be a tumor. They did, they did the test. They found out it wasn't that. The neurologist sent me in for a couple of MRIs and shot me through the machine. None of that seemed to help. But recently, I've been going to see John and Brad, who are physical therapists, and they've concluded that my neck pain is muscular and it can be treated by physical therapy. Now, I want to tell you, I'm impressed with John and Brad. They're awesome guys. They know their stuff. They understand my neck and all the muscles and the nerves that are in there. And I have the highest respect for them. And I believe in them. And they're making a difference. When I go in for treatments, they work me over. I mean, John knows how to find all my painful places. And he rubs the tender places. And he pushes on the tender places. And when he's doing that, I mean, it hurts really bad. He creates a lot of pain. Uh, when he's doing it, it feels way worse than it felt before I came in. It's like John is torturing me. But you know what? I keep coming back. And it's not because I'm some sadistic person, but I keep coming back for two reasons. No pain, no gain. And it's working. John is loosening things up and he's making me healthier and I'm seeing progress for the first time in a long time. And, and that's the goal for my neck. I want healing in my neck. And, and that goal makes all the pain that I'm going through now, all the things that John's doing to me, it makes the pain worth it because that's the goal, and the goal makes it all count. Friends, right now you may be going through some painful experiences. You may feel outnumbered, you may feel persecuted. You might feel overwhelmed by the trials of life. I wanna encourage you today, don't get discouraged. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the future glory you're going to have in heaven. Keep your eyes on the inheritance that's been promised to you. And know that in this life, God can use those trials to build a mature faith right now. Any pain 
that you're experiencing now will be worth it someday. So hang in there and don't give up. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you today. Um, I even thank you for the trials of life because they're accomplishing something. They're toughening us up. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we'll receive our inheritance and that we'll go to heaven and we'll be living in that land. We don't have land now, but we'll have a land then, a kingdom, a place, a new heaven and a new earth where it will be glorious. And so we fix our eyes on that goal. And we live our lives out today faithfully, hanging in there, toughening up, developing spiritual grit. And we're going we're gonna to stay true to you no matter what happens. Help everybody who hears this message today to be encouraged and to hang in there. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.